Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all in worship this morning. We have a guest with us this morning, a guest preacher. Uh, Pastor Tim Schneer uh, is representing the Lutheran Heritage Foundation this morning as our mission speaker. Um, he, uh, we, we would have had a mission festival normally in the fall. We didn't get to do that, so the Epiphany season is a great time for that, uh, for focusing on uh, God's mission as well. Uh, last Sunday of the Epiphany season is called Transfiguration, Transfiguration of Our Lord, and that's what we're uh, hearing about and, and uh, meditating on today. Our opening hymn is number 873, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies. Thank you. 
you read together the first six verses of Psalm 50. The mighty one, God of the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is the devouring fire. Around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. And please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the transfiguration of our Lord is from Exodus chapter 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what, was, what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, thanks be to God. God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4. This is also our preacher's text this morning, the sermon. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stand for the Gospel. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. 
and did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. For catechism uh, this morning, our, we review the uh, section on the confession, the three questions there. Normally I read the question and we all answer together. What is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. What sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Which are these? Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? Good things to consider as we uh, come near the Lenten season, Ash Wednesday being this week. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the second reading as Pastor Wood uh, shared with you a few moments ago. Please join me in a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. What a privilege Peter, James, and John were given that day on the mountain of transfiguration. They were the only ones whom Jesus took with him up that mountain. And they alone were given the vision of Jesus in his heavenly glory. They alone saw Elijah and Moses speaking with him. And they alone heard the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. But they aren't the only privileged ones today. 
so are you. Several years ago at a mad meeting of the Board of Elders of my previous congregation, we were discussing the issue of absent members. One of the uh, board members made a very insightful comment. He said, I don't understand this, Pastor. Coming to church isn't a duty. It's a privilege. Well, Carl was right on target. When you come to the divine service, you, just like Peter, James, and John, have the privilege to stand in the presence of the risen and glorified and reigning Son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And there is no veil concealing his presence from your eyes. He comes to you openly in his word and sacraments to reveal his glory. And he brings you once again to that mountain of transfiguration together with all his disciples. What a privilege it is for you to be here. This is a privilege of grace. For the fact is, we don't deserve to be here today. Think about Moses meeting with God on Mount Sinai in the chapter just before our text, or the uh, just before the Gospel reading, the Old Testament reading, excuse me. <clears throat> Moses asked God, please show me your glory. God said, I will make my goodness pass before you, but, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So on what basis can you claim the right to stand in the presence of God today? Do you think you could hold up your righteousness before him and he would make that acceptable? Heck, can you claim to stand in his presence because you've been such good parents or grandparents? Or because you've always treated your spouse with respect and love? Or because you've always been fair with all of your friends and always dealt honestly with everyone? Or because you have treasured the time that you spent hearing God's word? Or because you have never misused his name? Or because you've gladly shared the gospel with those, those that you have met? Well, Peter, James, and John stood in the presence of the transfigured and glorified Christ but only by grace. And so it is for you. God graciously reveals himself to you in the face of Christ today. It isn't a privilege that you have earned, for your sinfulness makes you unacceptable in God's presence. And yet God extends his grace to you today, inviting you into his very presence cleansing you of all your sin with the blood of his son, imparting his word to you, and giving you all his precious gifts, gifts for the sake of Christ. It is all a gift of grace. This is also a great privilege, though, that transforms us. Again, think of Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of stone. The skin of his face shone because he was talking with God. And at first the people drew back as we heard, but after telling them everything that the Lord had commanded, he would put that veil back over his face. Now you've probably heard it said, maybe you've even said it yourself, that Jesus takes us and loves us just the way we are. Is that right? Is God really satisfied with us just the way we are? Is he content to call us his own just the way we are? It is true that Jesus does take us and he loves us as we are, even with all of our sinfulness. But he takes us and loves us in order to make something new out of us something 
we can never be just as we are. You remember that Paul encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. He was confronted there with his sin, with his persecution of Christ. He was then baptized by God's messenger Ananias, and Paul became a changed man. The one who had come to Damascus in order to arrest Christians and all who proclaim Christ was now himself proclaiming Christ in all the synagogues of that village. When Christ confronts us and he claims us, he transforms us from sinners into saints. In our text, Paul put it this way, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You cannot come into the presence of the God of all creation and simply walk away unchanged. For the one who gathers you here gives you his gift of grace in the word of absolution and washes away all your sins. And the one who washes away your sins then bestows upon you a new spirit, a new man through his word. And the one who gives you this new spirit, who makes you a new man, then feeds you with his own body and blood to nurture and nourish that new life within you. Every time you come to this place, Christ himself is at work, transforming you from one glory into another, from sinner into saint. You simply cannot come into the presence of the everlasting, living, and glorious Christ, the Christ who gave himself into death to give you freedom from sin and death and walk away unchanged. It is a privilege that transforms you. And this, as Paul understood, was a privilege to be shared. This was the very purpose of Paul's life. As he said, therefore having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. The ministry which Paul received at that Damascus road was to bring the gospel to the hearts and lives of everyone he met. Christ had called him to this new life, and now he lived solely under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He became an apostle to the Gentiles. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, he writes, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul's life was now centered upon this one task of proclaiming Christ to the world. And Paul understood that this gospel which had changed his life was the gospel to be shared with the world. As Christ had served him, he was now ready to serve those whom Christ, to whom Christ sent him with the same gospel that had set him free. And that's the reason the Lutheran Heritage Foundation exists today. For nearly 30 years, LHF has served the mission of Christ's gospel. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Reverend Robert Rahm saw a crying need for the people living behind that iron curtain to know and understand the word of Christ. And with the help of several people, work began to provide pastors, teachers, missionaries, and simple believers with the tools they needed to teach the gospel to, to one another and to support the faith of those who believed. From that initial effort, Lutheran Heritage Foundation now provides Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven resources to people throughout the world in over 110 languages, distributing them into more than 80 countries of this creation. Luther's small catechism, a child's garden of Bible stories, 
the Book of Concord, and many other books enable this gospel to be shared and believers to be strengthened in their faith around the world. And this is the purpose that God has for you as a congregation and for you as individual believers. It doesn't mean that you suddenly have to drop everything you're doing and run over to the seminary. Nor does it mean that you have to volunteer to be a missionary in Africa. But what it does mean is that everything you do, pursuing a career, visiting with neighbors, enjoying retirement, preparing meals for your family, shoveling snow, going shopping, even wearing a mask, all of it is done in service to your neighbor, the one where God has placed you. Jesus once said to his disciples, you are my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And he says to you today, you are my witnesses. You are my witnesses at work with your fellow employees, at the grocery store where you meet a friend, at the post office where you speak with a businessman, at the school as you wait to pick up your grandchild, and in this place you, where you contribute to the work of the congregation and support the work of Lutheran Heritage Foundation. In fact, wherever God places you and puts others into your life, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, that elder was absolutely right. It is a privilege to be in God's house today. It's a privilege to stand here with the rest of your brothers and sisters in the faith in the very presence of him who lived and died and rose again for you. It isn't a privilege you deserve, but it is a gift of God's grace. It's a privilege that changes you inside and out, delivering you from the clutches of sin and death and imparting to you a new life of eternal freedom. And it is a privilege that God calls you to share with your family, your friends, your acquaintances, wherever you find yourself with people throughout the world. It is a privilege indeed. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is number 401. And I have some introductory music to that, to that and also some music that follows. We stand for the final stanza, number six. Uh, when you're done singing that, please be seated because there's a little bit of music that follows that. So you can just be seated when you're done singing.
day as well. I won't add any other music. But I would like to comment as far as the offering. Um, the offering for Lutheran Heritage Foundation can be received. If you want to send it in the mail, there's an envelope in your uh, in the thing that's in your bulletin uh, that you can detach and send. But if you'd like to save yourself a stamp and still give something to Lutheran Heritage Foundation, um, those can go in the offering plate today. Or for people watching the video, uh, we're going to hold those offerings to the end of the month before we send any in to Lutheran Heritage Foundation. So, uh, for example, even if you're here this morning and you didn't bring your checkbook, you want to bring something next week or, or whatever, that's fine. We'll, we'll uh, send them all in together at the end of February. Um, so, from there, we go to our prayers. And let's see. Um, we've been praying for Pam's husband, Keith, uh, for several weeks. It's been nearly a month that he's been in the hospital. He was sick a bit before that as well. Um, he was out of the ICU last week and went back in the ICU this week. And actually, yesterday, I checked in with Pam. Uh, just as they were leaving the hospital, they put him on a ventilator uh, at that point. Um, so they're obviously quite concerned, uh, trying to give his body a chance just to uh, relax and heal. Um, so uh, we keep him in prayer. And that actually prompted another prayer uh, for um, Ross and Kathy, who are not from our community, but they're related to uh, some people that were here last night, as well as some people that are here this morning, an aunt and uncle uh, to them. Um, so we keep them in our prayers as well. Kind of similar situation, have been in the hospital quite a bit and dealing with some health issues. So uh, please stand as we pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church and School, and scattered throughout the world, especially in the places where Lutheran Heritage Foundation works in many lands and in many languages, and for the proclamation of the gospel, the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, for public schools, especially here in West Washington County, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, especially those we know by name, Gary, John, Bill, Daryl, Gloria, Jean, Wayne, Katie, Mike, Verdell, Keith, Edmund, Wally, Regina, Carol, Don, Alice, Ross, and Kathy. And for all those who care for them, whether that is a medical professional or a family member, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those within our congregation uh, who <clears throat> celebrate birthdays this week, Dan, David, and Abby, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory, and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me.
unique. All right. Um, the only thing I guess I would encourage, other than reminding a Ash Wednesday service uh, this Wednesday, weather permitting, uh, 7 p.m. Um, so other than that, um, there's a display table out there that Pastor Schnarr, Schnarr, I, I say it wrong once, Pastor Schnarr uh, left us to look at. Um, it's got a lot of interesting languages on it uh, that you may or may not even have seen before, you may not have any idea how to pronounce, etc. Um, so books and such. There's also some freebie materials out there, some literature and other freebie things that you can take. Um, and I forgot to mention that uh, he mentioned in his presentation in Bible class, uh, Lutheran Heritage also received a matching grant, one of those where you, uh, if, if uh, somebody gives a dollar, it makes it, makes it into two. And I think the total amount of that grant was 100,000 something? 160,000. 160,000, so, and that's for anybody who's not given to them in the past 12 months, which I guess is probably most of us here. So um, if, if we uh, give anything, it'll be doubled you know, for right now. So um, and he'll be out there to chat with you, answer any questions you might have, that sort of thing. For a bit too, so. And by the way, if you do hear somebody named Schnarr, that's probably one of my distant relatives. Oh, okay. Yep. And it's spelled about three different ways. Okay. Um, so go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.